Randall Carlson, and uh, I think we are continuing on with some of the most interesting uh, bits here about the firestorms. We ended last uh, la- the last show with some fascinating uh, personal accounts read, uh, that Randall read from some letters, and I think we're going to be continuing on in that vein, right, Randall? Well, yeah, I think there's a few more unanswered questions about the whole that whole uh, yeah. sequence of events, uh, wouldn't you say? I think so. I don't think we've solved anything here, but I think we have raised some valuable questions in the process, but I don't think we've answered those questions. Think about the word question, right? And think about the story of the grail. Now, what is one of the great a themes? Quest. A quest, yes. A quest. A yes. quest, Yun. Get it? Yes. They both, I, I... a quest and a question. And, you know, think of the moral of the story. So Percival stumbles upon the castle Corbanic, which housed the grail. This is where the grail was kept. First, he had encountered the, uh, the lame fisher king fishing in a river. And then from there, he probably through some kind of special uh, guidance given to him by the fisher king, he uh, serendipitously study, uh, stumbled upon Castle Corbanic, went in and he was entertained in this great hall with a procession of these young people bearing uh, a, a strange objects. And he watched in fascination, but he refused to ask the critical question what it all meant. So he had this entire drama presented right before him, and he didn't ask the question of what was the meaning of what he was seeing because he was trying to be polite. And he had been told that, you know, you don't want to be too uh, outspoken and arrogant and, and uh, you should always listen. And just so he, he didn't ask the question. And because he didn't ask the question, the curse, the enchantment was not lifted. The curse was not broken. And so it had to go on for at least, it depends on which account you're reading, but at least another five years of of impoverishment and misery of the wasteland. But he could have ended it right there and healed the king right there if he'd asked the right question. That's, That's the basis of the story. And so the key to the successful completion of the quest, you see, is asking the right question at the right time. And now, it seems like uh, there's a lot of forces aligned to prevent the asking of obvious questions, questions that beg to be asked about some of the things that are going on in the world and in our nation today. But we won't go down that road because that takes us directly into the realm of politics. So let's just let's just think about a few of the things that we've learned over these past episodes. Uh, what was the first great fire that's now considered the greatest uh, fire, forest fire in at least Eastern Canadian history? It was the Miramichi. 1825. 1825, yeah. And what was the date on that? I think we found that there might be some significance to the date. That was October. Uh- October seventh, 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 hmm. and then of course we moved on to the Great Chicago Fire, and which was the greatest urban disaster, for fire disaster in American history, and the Peshtigo Fire, which was the greatest in terms of uh, mortality, anyway, the most deadly forest fire in American history, um, and we found out that they occurred essentially simultaneously on the same evening at about the same outbreak hour of outbreak at about 9 p.m maybe a little earlier it's, it's hard to tell but pretty much in that same window and then we also learned that there was the manistee fire across the lake across the lake michigan it was actually greater in magnitude and consumed more acreage but is less well known because of the fact that the, the mortality level was so much lower so we had those two fires, and they occurred on what was the date? October, October 8th. 8th. Then we learned, let's see, we learned about the Hinkley Fire, which had a lot of similarities in terms of the intensity, 
the speed, the ferocity, the anomalous uh, things associated with it made it very similar to the Pashtigo fire. But that was a completely different day. That was September. Right. So, so, but as far as the other fires, we learned that that particular date of 7th, 8th, and 9th seemed to be uh, a period that uh, these firestorms were very prevalent. So we then learned that something else occurred. Why? Because of the, the, the simultaneity of the outbreaks of these fires. Remember the descriptions now of um, almost as if there's uh, incendiary devices being set off simultaneously. That's how, how, how it was just several of these fire outbreaks were described. Yeah. And that it seemed like hilltops would catch on fire first and the fire would come down. The, the, you know, like the, right. The, um, the tops of buildings were on fire first. And the repeated um, sense of the fire being up in the, the heavens in itself the and yeah, in the, the air sky itself. Was on fire. Yeah, yeah. Right. And the fire was burning where there was no apparent combustible material. Yes. And that certain in certain places, people seem to witness things being consumed almost seemingly instantly by fire. Mm -hmm. Was it the wagon tongue? Was it that where the metal was completely destroyed and the wooden wood was not yeah. burned or something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All kinds of anomalous things like that that's that remind you of like almost like a torch. Like a torch. The torch of the avenging angel, you mean? Yes. Yeah, right. Exactly. That one. Yeah, that one. That that torch, yeah. Yes. Well, I think yeah. we we kind of were introduced to the avenging angel. We've we've pulled up his visage on several occasions. That's right. That's how he was depicted by uh, by some of our predecessors, our cultural predecessors. Yep. And what is that? What is that uh, deck you use called again? The Builders of Edom. Mm. The Builders of the Edom. Yeah. Paul Foster Case's deck was just basically a variation on the Rider Weight and the mm. the earlier Marseille decks. Uh, and others, but he put his own particular, added his own little seasoning to it. And he was yeah. quite a learned uh, scholar of occultism, ancient traditions, things like that. So he added some stuff that um, you got to wonder. Hmm. In the Rider Waite, um, the booklet that comes with it, they talk about how a lot of the symbolism comes from ancient Egypt. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so there was lots of interesting hints in those symbols that may connect possibly back to the Grail stuff that you were just talking about. You know, oh, there very the, absolutely is. Yeah, and the seeds, the yud, mm -hmm. the Ace of Cups. Yeah, that's it right there. That is a depiction of the whole concept of the Grail right there, the Ace of Cups. And we've looked at that, and boy, yeah. there's a lot more to talk about there. And that's interesting stuff. But so, we'll, that brings so are us. We, are, we zoom, are we zeroing in on the right questions with yeah. all of this stuff? Okay. But I will just say this, that when we start getting into that, that analysis of the Ace of Cups, that takes us straight into the realm of exobiology. Mm. But um, it's good just even for us to kind of refresh our mind on some of the details. Because remember, the devil's in the details. And this could be, um, speaking of the devil... I mean, maybe we are, in fact, looking at the, uh, the handiwork of the devil here. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, you think so? Well, a, serp a serpent or a dragon? A hey. serpent or a hey, dragon, man. yes. Serpents yes. are the good guys. Serpents are the good guys. But, you know, hey, that's <laughs> the thing. The serpents can be the bad guys, too. Yeah, they can. Yeah. yeah. Um, just like uh, Hathor can turn into Sekhmet, which we're going right. to come back to in a second here um but yeah let's uh since you said that and mentioned serpents and i think maybe we'll just uh take well, a look we want to remind of what's going on exogenically right during those dates yeah please do wasn't well, that where you're going you're well, doing it brad well the serpent and right. the dragon uh 
leads leads to Constellation Draco and the Draconid meteor shower. And the Draconid meteors, yes. Is that exactly was, on those dates. That was exactly on those dates, yes. And we saw some very compelling symbolism there, didn't we? The plumed serpent is shown devouring a man. Hmm. All right, so there we've got is that St. George. St. George. All right. So what's he doing? You notice, okay, he's got this long lance. He's she's got the dragon on a leash. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. And he is appears to be stabbing the dragon in the eye with a long lance. I thought it was right in the nostril. Interesting. Maybe it's in the nostril. But Excellent. in effect, what we're looking at right here actually um, may have us some clues. Look at this. Signer, Siegfried displaying Fafner. Get it? Can you see the coiled dragon yes. serpent here? Yep. Here's Siegfried's sword. Yeah. He's doing battle with Fafner. And he's in the Hercules pose. Sure. He sure is. Isn't That's true. He is, he is. Yeah, he's into Hercules. Look at that. Yep. Wow. And look, look like, like look at his, his leg here. Yeah. And definitely got the Hercules lunge going on. Yeah, look at this. Another depiction of Siegfried doing battle with the great dragon serpent, Fafner. Now, this is some great stuff. That is cool. Oh, man. Look at that one. The substantial beast. Yeah, a substantial yes. beast indeed. It is. That is a that is a great water serpent right there. Another codex. That's the from the Dresden Codex. And here is look at this. I, I think this is completely a mind blowing connection right here because here's the dragon serpent, the, the dragon sky serpent, uh, belching out the waters of the water, great flood. The water, yeah, yeah. Of the yep. flood. What? While the god of death. Waits on the sideline here. See, this is the myth of Phaeton by Gustav. Gustav Moreau. And this is Phaeton. That's Phaeton falling to Earth. And he's telling us the timing of it. I mean, uh, there's the bland man of the ecliptic. So the, sun, the sun is in Leo there? You see, if you look at the bottom of the painting, underneath the uh, uh, bull's head or dragon's head, no, I'm sorry. That's beneath the horse. Right below to the right of the moon, there's rays from a setting sun. Hmm. I would think that the oh, sun. So then, actually, that's that's uh, probably with the moon behind a cloud. Yeah, that's yeah. what it was looking and like. And then the yeah. horizon is actually this. Yeah. Hmm. I can see that now. Yeah, I see the serpent. So it's you got Phaeton in the the chariot. The horses are going crazy. Mm -hmm. The lions up there to tell you, give you a hint about the time of time of year or yeah, or the or the, or the, the age, year. the zodiacal the age. age of Leo. Right. right. I'm thinking it could be the zodiacal age of Leo. Yeah. Wow. And then the dragon rising up from the earth. Mm -hmm. That's St. Michael, I believe, on this one, not St. George. Once again, don't notice the spear, the lance that's always being wielded by the, yeah. by the hero. And then oh, up a, here. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to call attention to this lady back here. Is he defending the lady from the dragon? She doesn't seem to be concerned. She's just <laughs> she watching the sunset. <laughs> doesn't have a leash on it this time either. Right. Doesn't have a leash on it this time either. And that thing's more like a wyvern. A wyvern. Yeah, yeah. a wyvern. Yeah. Explain what a got wyvern. The bird. It's got, well, it's part, it's like a dragon, but it's got kind of a bird yeah. front. Yeah. Uh-huh. So here, the next one is very explicit about association of the serpent with a meteor 
And here's another one from oh. Theatrum Comedicum. That's 1667, a traditional European depiction of a comet as a cosmic serpent. A meteor as a descending dragon. So when when you get into the mythology of serpents and dragons, well, you have the you know you have the winged serpents, the plumed serpents, but you have dragons which are can be creatures of the sky or creatures of the earth. Yeah, and I think that's a very significant uh, character trait that is the clue to what we're really looking at here. We'll okay. explore the um, the earth dragon myths and the serpent myths, and I think what it leads us to is right into the realm of telluric energy okay cool and geomancy or that's way cooler than volcanoes well are they're they're probably connected in fact we could say they're certainly connected yeah you're right though it is interesting because when the dragon's in the sky it's depict it's flying it may be breathing fire when it's in the earth it's sleeping on a pile of jewels and gold like wealth or treasure you know like mm -hmm. in the standard story so but it can be woken and it can rise up from the oh, earth. Yeah. That's if right. you wake it up, you got a big problem. And breathe yeah. fire. That's mm -hmm. right. How do we envision there might be a real world connection with the earth serpent, the earth dragon under the earth? And I think what that comes down to is possibly, and, it, and this would link with volcanism, because, you know, the crust is fractured. There are fault lines. There are fractures within the earth's crust. And... There's also various kinds of ores and minerals within the Earth's crust. There's movements of the Earth's crust. Sometimes you'll have contiguous sections of the Earth's crust moving it, uh, relative to each other. That would be what defines a fault line in most cases. And this can generate changes in the electromagnetic field. Now, a lot mm -hmm. of those fractures and fault lines that we're talking about in the crust of the Earth there's a whole school of thought that most of those fractures and fault lines are the consequence of cosmic hypervelocity impacts throughout the history of the Earth. Yeah. Okay. Which makes sense. Yeah. And I was also it. I was also going to say that the connection with the dragon in the Earth sleeping with the treasure is like you know at the center of impacts is where you find lots of very rare metals. That's right. So. You know, if you yeah, think of uh, Sudbury up in Canada. Think of the Vrita Fort structure in south africa there's many yeah. examples where astro gleams are the sources of platinum precious metals, metals platinum yeah. movement yes right and now we know that they make trillions of tiny diamonds so they have jewels as well you yes know, it's like yeah strange how all this can connect back to these very ancient stories yes so <laughs> what is the opposite of levity gravity um, Right? Gravity. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I can see Duh. that. That's right. Gravity and levity. Gra gravitas. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, well, I was about to go off on a tangent, a very interesting tangent, but I kind of told myself I wasn't going to go off on tangents. But I'll just mention who. Well, just uh, you can't uh, not one do. thing. One thing. Okay. So, my point being, <laughs> in the interests of levity, who was. Uh, given the task of transporting the Ark of the Covenant from one place to another by means of staves passed through uh, the rings of the Levites. Mm -hmm. David, there we go. The Levites. The Levite. The Levite. Yes, yeah. of course. I get it. So mull that over, and in the next episode, we might circle back to that. All right, I'll think about that. Yeah. If you think of the levity being the opposite of gravity, yeah, and then if you remember that because the ark was composed of so much gold, it was extremely heavy. It was. It was. Yes. But anyways, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> but I love this. I love this mound. I love this. Uh, I've. I've. I don't know. I've read about a lot of about it, and I have been dying to get up there to see it. It's worth seeing, and and you know what's great is that in this area, there's so many. It's one of the thickest densest clusters of monumental earthworks still existing in this area of Ohio. Gotta so, go. you know, you can, you can include this in a, uh, a multi, uh, site, uh, tour. 
Yeah. And we should do that. Yeah. We should actually we, we should please let's I let's think this would that. be an awesomely awesome tour. And and because there's it's, so much astronomy and earth, you know, I mean, yeah, the whole yeah. Well let's uh it's I just love it. It's a beautiful representation mm -hmm. of the, you know, the idea of this like a comet or an impact or yeah, something. The serpent carrying the cosmic egg. And you know, it's got the spiral at the end, like you can imagine, you yeah. know, the object is out there making orbiting its and orbits orbiting and over orbiting. and over, and then eventually it gets pulled in by a planet, and it goes through this little zigzag motion as it's yep. being pulled into the inner solar system, and then it's like the thing is positioned right on the edge of an astrobleam. It's just so, like, I mean, this is... Yeah, it's... I, this it's, blows my mind. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to get there. I hope we can do it. You mentioned, Kyle, that it's right on the edge of an astro bloom. Let's look at this here. Let's see. Here we yeah. go. I love this picture. Gosh, look at that. Yeah. I love this picture. It's also on a peninsula between two uh, converging streams. Yes. It is in a perfect position. Like a diamond head. And yeah. you can actually see the mouths of these openings into the, that are almost, you know, nostrils nostrils yeah oh man yeah and you can see look here you see the the triangular shape of the viper's head yeah right here so it's and, a natural formation that they were like yes this is a serpent mm -hmm. I don't and, know. Uh, you That's... can see it winding around back this way the tails out here and then over here is the basin of the ancient impact structure so how about that so cool so cool so, see, here's the thing. This whole landscape is probably honeycombed with, um, with caves and apertures and uh, capillaries mm. through here. The water can move through the earth here as well as on the surface. Mm. But my point about what's happened to the bedrock there, see, that, that fracturing of the bedrock now allows for the movement of fluids. Of all kinds it could be water it mm. could be fluid basaltic magma and hence the connection with with uh, volcanic eruptions when you were mentioning volcanism earlier kyle um because there may be a connection between the location of volcanoes volcanic activity and impacts that's not uh, I, I can imagine yeah yeah so then how many of you remember this? The Portsmouth Works, the giant serpentine effigy that's basically no longer there. And it consisted of a series of concentric rings. Then it crossed the Ohio River, came up here, and then there was this kind of scattering of mounds, structures, uh, circular dome structures, arch structures. These, of course, are all gone now because the city of Portsmouth is here. But then you can see what appears to almost be kind of a serpent's head coming back. And then it crosses the river again. And then there's another earth mound here, which the remnant is still there. Brad and I have visited that. We visited this. Um, this is a remnant over here. That's all that's left. The ring structure is mostly. No, wait a minute. That. No, no, that was Newark where the golf course was. Yeah, that was Newark. Um but yeah, this was once part of a structure that was in total length, 10 miles long. Incredible. It's it. Yeah, it's totally incredible. So somebody, somebody went to a lot of effort to, to do all of this. The origins of the red dragon on the flag of Wales are kind of controversial and mysterious, but how interesting Wales, think about Wales. What, what are, you know, the things we associate with Wales, the quest, Arthur, uh, all of that, the whole, the Welsh stories. So the, here's, uh, this is from um, the Morian Institute, uh, the European Dark Age and the Welsh oral tradition on the trail of the dragon. The mystery of the origins of the red dragon symbol now on the flag of Wales has perplexed many historians, writers, and romanticists, and the archaeological community generally has refrained from commenting on this most unusual emblem. There are translations from the various uses of the Welsh word drag. Amongst them are common uses of the word, which is today taken just to mean a dragon. But in times past, it has also been used to refer to 
Melt distal, which is probably not even close to what it's pronounced, but was usually taken to mean sheet lightning. And this makes sense as the Welsh word main translates as stone, while the Welsh word whatever translates as lightning, so literally a lightning stone. I think we've made a very interesting foray into the connection between cosmic phenomena, some kind of a terrestrial counterpart, and the association of serpents and dragons with both phenomena. And therein, I think we have an opening into understanding what I think is probably one of the most powerful metaphysical uh, systems of symbology that have come down to us, which is the corpus of grail material from the Middle Ages. I think that's awesome. That's that's great. Yeah. And I think this stuff Fantastic. that we've come up with so far really is going to be sort of a, one of the keys that will unlock that doorway into the mysteries of the grail is understanding these connections. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia. Still um, digging into the ekperusis. Is that the proper pronunciation? I think it's close enough. All right. And I, I'm really loving the discussion about these, you know, the mounds, the all the serpent uh, yes, theology. Yes, that is some rich stuff there for it sure. It is rich stuff. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's jump back for a second to the Great Chicago Fire. And... Uh, Mike, I'll ask you this question, so you haven't said much. Who is often uh, blamed for starting the Great Chicago Fire, Mike? This is O'Leary's cow. I knew Mike would have that right. information. At his, yeah, Mrs. O'Leary. Yes, Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Yeah, well, there we see. There's, there's the, uh, the folklore. Mrs. O'Leary and her cow, and the cow is kicking over the lantern, and this is what started the fire. But I kind of find Mrs. O'Leary, oops, Mrs. O'Leary's cow, jumping ahead here, Mrs. O'Leary's cow to be a, perhaps a useful metaphor. So who was the cow in ancient Egypt? Hathor was the Hathor. cow goddess. Seems to have been popular at all periods of ancient Egyptian history. A cow goddess appears in the Narmer palette, which dates from about 1300, 3100 BC. That's a long time ago. Hathor was often represented entirely as a cow. In the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, there's a famous statue of her in this form. Hathor was otherwise depicted as a beautiful, slender woman wearing a headdress of a pair of cow's horns. With a sun disc between them, or in human form with cow's ears. Very key. She was represented as a woman with the entire head of a cow. She thus represents divine motherhood. Yeah. On it at uh Dendera, I think most of the depictions of her face there were with the, the cow's ears. Right. And the meaning of that name, Hathor, is House of Horus. House of what? Horus. Horus, yeah. Sorry. Should have enunciated that a little bit better. So there is a representation of Hathor, the cow goddess. What I find particularly intriguing about that is her headdress. Does it appear yeah. to be sort of a red globular thing? Looks almost like, like some yeah, it's got a tail. Yeah. Oops, plumes emanating out here. Yeah. And and Shockwave. Uh huh. Right. Uh huh. Oh, well, usually Hathor was a benign goddess. However, in the myth, the destruction of humankind, she was sent by her father, the sun god Ra, or Ra, to punish the Egyptians for their disloyal murmurings against him. She changed from her maternal cow like self and became the raging lioness Sekhmet. Sekhmet. Yeah. Sekhmet, yeah. 
So, so from the bull to the lion. So there, there, there she is there. The function of Sekhmet slash Hathor as an agent of Ra is made manifest in the destruction of mankind myth found on the five royal New Kingdom tombs um, and is itself part of a larger work known as the Book of the Cow of Heaven. According to this story, Ra plans the destruction of rebellious mankind and the Council of the Gods advises him, let your eye go and smite them for you, these schemers of evil. May it go down as Hathor. Let your eye go and smite them. May it go down as Hathor. I find that to be interesting words. Um, the eye. And then... Yeah, that's a little bit comet-like, too. Yeah, the headdress. What I want to do now is go to what I think of as perhaps a kind of a modern replay, right? How many of you guys remember the fires of fall of 2017? I do remember there were some big ones out there. Santa Rosa fire. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's take a little more uh, detailed look at some of those fires and see okay. if there's any. So um, here's from uh WPRI.com, Eyewitness News, fall of 2017. Uh, the title of the uh, news report is Wildfires Ravage Northern California with Shocking Speed. Santa Rosa, California. Over the AP wire, an onslaught of wildfires across a wide swath of Northern California broke out almost simultaneously, mm. then grew exponentially, swallowing up properties from wineries to trailer parks and tearing through both tiny rural towns and urban subdivisions. The fires were so intense the descriptions of them are apocalyptic. According to a New York Times dispatch from a neighborhood in Santa Rosa, California, the fire burned virtually everything it touched. Evidence of the fire's intensity was everywhere in Coffee Park, which residents described as an apocalyptic scene. The aluminum wheels on cars melted and dripped down driveways like tiny rivers of mercury before hardening. A pile of bottles melded together into a tangle so contorted it looked like a Picasso. Plastic garbage bins were reduced to mere stains on the pavement. The flames were unforgiving throughout the city, torching block after block with little to no salvage. Hundreds of homes in the Fountain Grove area were leveled by flames so hot they melted the glass off of cars and turned aluminum wheels into liquid. One neighborhood of older homes was scorched, leaving only brick chimneys and downed power lines. Residents who gathered at emergency shelters and grocery stores said they were shocked by the speed and ferocity of the flames. The massive Tubbs fire started in Napa County late Sunday before spreading into Sonoma County during the night. Percy described its destructive path. It traveled 16 miles in an instant. It just came roaring over the hills. It was indiscriminate, and it was very, very fast. You know, there's so much energy there. It, can, it, it draws air in. It creates pressure above and a vacuum around it. and tornadoes it's, and yeah, yeah. It, it, there it's it's incredibly powerful stuff um just large fires yeah and i mean i can understand why people would say it's like you know it looks like the sky is on Look fire at that that's amazing this this is pretty yeah, wild isn't that. it
Talk about apocalyptic. Yeah. That, my friends, would qualify as a wasteland. It does. Yeah. It, a, a large difference between one day and the next. Yeah. So here again is a is a sort of a microcosmic example of catastrophe. How in an instant, in this case, a matter of literally a few hours, an entire well, you know, whether it's an ecosystem or a you know a cultural system is just almost entirely erased. This is what it looked like the day before this. Yeah. And that's crazy. Wow. So, you know, this is the kind of things you have to be factoring in when you're asking the question about, you know, why there may be such a paucity of evidence for, you know, what things were going on culturally or in terms of civilization 10 or 15 or 20,000 years ago. Yeah. Where, yeah. where are the tools yeah. that built those houses? That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah. There's remains oh, of a like, mobile home. Like a... Yep. Melted wheels. And look at this upside down. Upside That's down. Testimony how the powerful, they had to have been like cyclonic winds to do this. Gale force winds capable of overturning cars. Or a gas tank eruption. Yeah. Rivers of melted chrome. Wow. That. The me melted engine. Question. When you started seeing the devastation and they started showing those ho these homes in complete dustification of all the buildings, what were you thinking as a fireman? The fire captain, John Lord, said, the first thing I that I noticed, I think, was the rapidity of the fire movement, which seemed abnormally fast, considering that there was no weather fronts or winds or anything that I was aware of that would spread the fires that quickly. Also, the number of fires were extremely alarming. Where did all these fires come from? How did they all start at once? And so I started digging. Looking at the destruction, which I had never seen in my career, the totality of the destruction on the structures, there was absolutely nothing left of the structures except foundation. Now, I've seen that with other fires, but not where it moves like that, not where the fire is moving. And on one side of the street, everything is fine. And on the other side of the street looks like a nuclear war zone. I've never seen anything like that. This is from um, a fire investigator, Kerry Fiesel. I am sorry. I have worked far too many fire restoration jobs and worked far too many house fires to believe that what I am seeing in the news reports, houses just don't burn to ash, not even if you soak them in gasoline. You folks got something else going on out there. And anyone with any knowledge of fires knows a brush fire or a house fire doesn't burn hot enough to melt and bend half-inch steel I-beams. It takes a hell of a lot of heat to turn a whole trailer park to ash and bent beams. Comet Holmes, outgassing what appears to be a bluish colored gas. And look at the look at the tail here coming off. Yeah. Hmm. So we've noticed. In, in these fires, then, quite a few parallels with the historic fires that we were looking at, right? Let's think of them. The, un, the unprecedented, unprecedented rapidity with which the fires came on, right? That was clearly one of the, 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 the similar characteristics. Another one was, um, you know, the but intensity. Started. Oh. oh, well, yeah, okay, that, that there was these, all these fires, like they named 14 fires, all appeared to start simultaneously. Now, that yeah. to me is a very tricky thing to try to explain. This is what I said in the aftermath of the California firestorms. I wrote this right like within a month or two after these firestorms. Okay. In the aftermath of the California firestorms, quite a number of people on the Internet were putting forth the idea that they resulted from the deployment of directed energy weapons. Without going yeah. into the technical details of 
D-E-W, it is perhaps not surprising that many people, when confronted with the abnormal nature of these firestorms, would try to find a feasible explanation for their extreme intensity, the rapidity of their onset, their simultaneous ignition over broad regions, and the selectivity and capriciousness with which they performed their disastrous handiworks. The parallels between the fires uh, of California with historic firestorms such as Miramichi, Peshtigo, Chicago, and Hinkley conflagrations are obvious and striking. However, I would think most of us would agree that it is not likely that directed energy weapons were the cause of any of those firestorms of 1825, 1871, 1894, or 1910, all of which displayed similar and even greater levels of intensity, rapidity, simultaneity, and selectivity than the California fires. Is it conceivable that in the case of these disastrous firestorms we are seeing at work, a natural process that has heretofore gone wholly unrecognized, a natural process that involves the interaction of terrestrial and extraterrestrial forces. We now know that comet nuclei contain abundant amounts of methane, ethane, and acetylene, all highly flammable gases. Two questions now arise. Is it possible that these compounds could somehow be released from their cometary matrix and be delivered into the Earth's atmosphere? And given that, is it possible that under the right meteorological conditions, these gases could accumulate in the atmosphere to densities sufficient for combustion? So the question, if some process is possible, the system for ecperusis then becomes complete. The solid cometary matter forming the present day draconid meteor stream in the case of the October 7th through 9th fires, behaves like a swarm of cosmic flints, which by generating sparks as they burn up in the atmosphere, ignite flammable gases accumulated in the lower troposphere. Of course, at this, idea, this, at this stage, this idea is only hypothetical. It would most certainly be controversial. But given the similarities of these events over time and space, and given the known co-occurrence with a powerful meteor stream, in the fires of 1825, 1871, and given the pervasive, extreme, and unusual features of all these great firestorms, and given what is known about the composition of comets, to dismiss the possibility of a comet connection is to be left with a series of coincidences just as or more unlikely. As to the X factor, I would rather not indulge in speculation at this point. But I might venture to say this, the record of myth, legend, and tradition recognizes the reality of great ecperusis events, and from the central position they occupy in both the mythic record and universal apocalyptic prophecy, we can confidently assume that mega firestorms along with mega deluges have left an indelible impression on the human psyche. Also, given the scale and variant nature of catastrophes of all kinds, we could also confidently assume that the devastating fires of recent centuries are but diminutive reflections of their ancient counterparts. And given that there is, in fact, a historical reality behind such tales and legends regarding the great destructions, what are we to make of myths of an alternate order of beings? Look at this. All right. There we go. There it is. Fireball oh descending gosh. over Napa Valley, approximately 8 p.m., October 8th. And what was the night, the Sunday night that all these fires broke out in 14 different places simultaneously? October 8th. Oh, my God. Are you serious? Well, there it is. It's right there. And there's, we go back to this. Look at here. From the American Meteorological Society Fireball Reporting Site. Look what I've got highlighted here. Extraordinary meteor activity over California in the hours leading up to the conflagration. Numerous fireball sightings all over California. But no, this idea here that we're proposing obviously is completely preposterous, right? 
It's all just coincidence. That is incredible. So here we go. Is it possible that there could be pockets of gas in space? That would be and virtually invisible, right? You virtually know, just, invisible, but yeah. under the right conditions and circumstances, is it possible that such a thing could accumulate in the atmosphere? That's my question. Yeah. yeah or is it completely right. out of the question? It's definitely not completely out of the question, but. Good question. It's a good question. Well, didn't we learn tonight that it's all about asking the right questions? Asking the right questions. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Do you There's recall sublimate. my showing the um, the buckyball, the methane hydrates? Yes, that's right. I would think. Yes. I would suggest yeah. that that might be a route to explore as a possible delivery mechanism. Right, delivery, delivery mechanism. mechanism. Yes, yeah. that that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, is it's got to, but I don't know. What do I know? Well, here we go. We'll end with this quote: A series of fires sparked in the Napa Valley on October eighth and grew as powerful winds pulled the flames across fields and freeways. The cause of the fires remained under investigation. Flames began to devour swaths of Northern California wine country after most people went to bed on Sunday, October 8th. Wow. Sunday, October 8th, the same day as Peshtigo and the Great Chicago Fire. Wow. Yeah, and the, the sightings of the fireballs right on that thing. That's, 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 yeah. So I have to wonder too: Is are these are these high winds perhaps a byproduct of these gases being, you know, pushed down into the atmosphere and causing, yep, some kind of turbulence in the atmosphere? This causes. So you've got the igniter, you've got the ignition, you've got the fuel, and then suddenly you have this the bellows, <laughs> the bellows. Yeah, just, it's all part of the same, or the same mechanism. Wow. Now, if you combine something like this on a global scale or even only a partial global scale, but then also that's associated with we now we know the mega scale distribution of gigantic floods. We add to this the floods and the fires, and we think about, you know, Plato's writings about there have been many destructions of mankind brought about by many agencies, but most of them have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water. Yeah. And I think yep. what we're trying to show here is that these agencies of destruction have from time to time operated on a scale way beyond anything we've experienced in our historic times. And that, in fact, our historic times are what they are simply because we've had an interval without a cosmic destruction long enough for us to recover and build a civilization, a new manifestation, a new incarnation of civilization. But what guarantee is there? that the same forces that have been unleashed on this planet many, many times previously won't happen again. And especially right. if we're not paying attention because we're too busy squabbling amongst ourselves about completely made up shit, border disputes, mainly. Yep. If we're looking at a multi-impact event because of, say, mm -hmm. the planet going through the trail of a disintegrating comet, we could have simultaneously uh, impacts we could simultaneously have impact, surface impacts and aerial detonations, along with simultaneously impacts into the ground, into the oceans, into the ice sheets. And so if we're looking at this kind of a multiple impact event, you can see right there, it's going to get extraordinarily complicated to right. try to try to sort everything out. But it can but be done. Well, now we yeah, can, yeah. I think, go back and revisit some of the ancient myths, legends, and stories. Uh, with a new perspective. Absolutely. That's yep. you know, like one of the things you showed, one of the codex pictures had the, the dragon spewing water. Yeah, like that's fire. right. Yeah. Right. So it's like there's, this is all the Hydra. It's ancient. People have known about this. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, Randall. Well done, sir. Thank you so much. Yep. Excellent thank show. You. Okay. Thank you. So look for more information on that in the future. Brad, of course, will put all the links for this in the show notes. And Kronos had his hat on, so it is the end of the show. Thank you all, gentlemen. Thanks, Mike. Well timed. Yeah. Good night, gentlemen. Once good again. Night. Good night, Randall. Brad. Good night, Mike. Good night, everybody. Adios, gentlemen.